Okay, I think we are now streaming on YouTube. All right. So this week, I'll give you the link to a second, Hugo. Uh, I've got it. Great. Uh, this week, we're talking to Alex Egg from Grubhub, who's going to do, what do you do this week, Alex? Um, we're going to look at um, kind of the end-to-end -end process of um, designing a machine learning model from scratch, um, get data, train it, um, all with eye on deployment and productionization. So we're gonna look at the end-to-end -end pipeline. That's very cool. What are we actually trying to achieve? Like what's the, what's the output? The, of the end product is gonna be a text classifier. Okay, for so, search you're, queries. so this yeah. is, I'm saying, I really like these tacos and you are saying, oh, that's a positive response on this, uh, this customer. Yeah, so I, I'll motivate the example, um, but the key is, you know, um, I work for Grubhub. It's an online food um, pickup and delivery marketplace. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, it's the app on it, and there's a search. So I'm a, I'm a data scientist on the search team, um, and depending on what you type as a search query, um, there's optimizations that can take place to make the query faster and better. And how we identify what you type is called query intent detection. So we're going to build a text classifier on search queries to predict what your intent is, whether you want some type of cuisine, you're just browsing, you know, your favorite, you know, Mexican restaurants, or are you actually looking for maybe some obscure dish, um, like, um, not obscure, but um, like a less common, like beef bourguignon, for example. Um, so solving those two queries is actually very different on the back end. One of them is a simple, text field lookup, another one is a more complicated full text search. So if we can avoid doing the expensive one, we don't have to, um, that's beneficial. So that's what we'll, we'll try and do today, detect what a user's intent is. Okay. That Very all sounds exciting. really exciting. And I didn't expect to be made hungry um, <laughs> this early in, in, in the morning. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone joining us on, on YouTube Live. Please introduce yourself. Let us know uh, where, where you're calling in from in, in the chat and what your interest in, in distributed compute and, and Dask or food is in, in, in general. Um, but as Matt said, we're very excited to have Alex Egg uh, from Grubhub who, who uses Dask um, at several points in the search intent uh, ETL pipeline. Um, I'm Hugo Van Anderson, um, Head of Data Science Evangelism and Marketing at Coiled. And we're here with Matt Rocklin, uh, who's the CEO of Coiled uh, and works on Dask as well and, and maintains, maintains Dask. Um, so maybe to get started, I, I always, well, I, yeah, I think I do always ask this question most days of my life actually. Um, Matt, can you tell us what Dask is? Yeah, so long-term uh, viewers of this will know that I never actually answer that question. I always try to defer it to our listener or to our guest. Uh, so Alex, what is Dask to you? I look at Dask in the context of, you know, what I was just talking with you offline is the data frame wars. Um, there's lots of data frames in the world. Um, big ones now are, of course, Spark, um, a more common one use day to day, maybe these pandas, and then this really nice data frame API uh, that's similar to running a SQL query. Um, and it's nice because you have common patterns that you can take from a really small scale to a really big scale. Um, and I look at Dask as fitting right on in there with Spark. Um, so I use Dask as a replacement for Spark um, because all of my tools and all of my workflows are in the Python world. So it's really nice if I can have my um, parallel map reduce in Python instead of the JVM. So that's what Dask is to me. Cool. That's great. And so that's one of the big selling points for Dask as opposed to other packages is that it integrates nicely with the, a lot of other Python stuff and PyData stuff. Definitely. Um, if I could look at a Python error message instead of a JVM stack trace, I'm very happy. Great. I'm, um, I'm going to quote you on that. I usually quote myself on that and I'm going to quote, quote, quote you on that. I think we, we have quoted Alex on that. I think Alex is actually in our Who Uses Dask slide deck um, uh, with a quote very similar to that. Yeah, it's funny you should mention that deck because I, I thought to just, just show it, show a few slides from it. Um, once again, we've got a few more people rolling in. Um, welcome to our, our, our live stream with Alex Eggs, Senior Data Scientist at Grubhub. Um, so I'll just show a few slides about Who Uses Dask for um, the potentially uninitiated and to refresh the memories of the initiated. I will share my screen. Let's see. Okay, and I'd just like some sort of confirmation from Matt and, and Alex when my screen is is okay, shared. And when I change slides, do you see the next slide? We do. 
That's great. So look, Dask, beautiful logo, beautiful slide. Who, use, who uses Dask is, is what I'll talk about in, in 120 seconds. Um, well, the truth is that Dask is used um, increasingly more and more wherever Python is used. And as we know, this is, happens to be everywhere th these days. Um, we'll see a few examples from the life sciences, uh, retail, including Grubhub, um, finance, and uh, the geophysical sciences. I may not go through all, all of these, but I just wanted to give a, give a sense. Um, for high resolution cellular imaging, this is actually from from our friends at um, Harvard Medical School and Chan Zuckerberg uh, Initiative, uh, among other places. But this is um, Tally Lambert, who will appear on, on a coming Science Thursday in August, I, th I think we have scheduled. Um, as Tally said, Dask lets me prototype pipelines on my laptop and scale easily to his institution's compute cluster. The fact that it mimics common APIs made adopting it nearly uh, effortless. And that's something Alex just, just spoke to. Um, and Alex, I, I think, spoke to the fact that it mimics common APIs and it's compatible with the PyData stack, um, but also the fact that the, the error messages, I mean, what it's running in the back end is, for the most part, the code that you think it will be, will be running. Um, Novartis uh, um, Institutes for Biomedical Research. We actually had Eric Ma doing machine learning pipelines of um, chemical melting points uh, recently at, at scale. Um, and so this is an example from, from Eric's work, and I, I won't quote him at length here, but he did state that Dask helped them scale up machine learning prototypes, and we saw that recently. So go and check that out if, if you haven't. Um, I'm going to skip that one, and then also that one. Uh, we have retail logistics in Walmart, demand forecasting, which is a great story, of, um, which we hope to tell uh, one day which, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but involves uh, both, uh, it involves GPUs, Rapids, and XG Boost. Yeah, and many other things, I'm sure, too. Yeah. Um, and then we have word embeddings at Grubhub. And this is not the example we're going to talk, to, talk about today. Um, but Alex and I, when we synced on figuring out what example to go through today, um, were kind of there were two really cool examples we could go through and, 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 and use cases, um, and we chose the other one, but we may, we may bring this to you in, in, in the future, but this is word yeah, embedding. This was a really cool um, project we did called Dish Hierarchy, where you know Grubhub is a big catalog of chaos, right? A lot of menu items. Um, and we don't know whether a given menu item is you know, a cookie or a bibimbap. So this is a really cool project where we used um, a big language model to categorize our catalog into um, a big graph, Dish Hierarchy. That's awesome. And of course, you required a lot of parallelization there and you used Dask oh, yeah. as well, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, awesome. Well, you know, people haven't tuned in to listen to my dulcet tones. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone once again. And I, I suggest that we kind of get started and, and, and jump in to uh, the, the user intent uh, search ETL pipeline. Yeah, sure. So I'll um, share my screen and we'll get started. We got a, a, a busy agenda today. Woo. So here's right. the outline. Um, we're going to look at um, real quick what the motivation is, what we're going to do. I kind of you know mentioned a little bit with Matt. Um, we're going to um, do some ETL. We're going to pull the data from our big data lake. Um, we're going to do something called weak supervision. Um, that's where we're going to use the snorkel project. Um, then we're going to do some modeling um, with Keras and TensorFlow. That's to actually build the classifier. And then we'll talk a little bit about deployment and, and instrumentationalization, the hard word to say. So, um, you know, I hope you realize as we step through this today that we're, our eye is always on deployment and productionalization. Um, our goal isn't to just build a one-off model that's stuck in a notebook. We actually want to use this in a production environment while minimizing um, duplication um, and redundant code. So we'll share some interesting ways. Um, I'll share some interesting ways that we're doing that um, at Grubhub. So let's get right into it. Here's are, the motivation. You, are, are you yeah. accessing the the data lake currently? The, yes. Or, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. We're doing it live. Um, so here, let's step back, right? So once again, what is Grubhub? This is Grubhub. Um, you turn it on, um, it shows you food, delicious things. Here's a query for French, right? So um, Matt, Hugo, what is the user's intent? From this query, what what do they what what's in their mind? Why why they type French? I I feel like I'd want a French a French restaurant. Yeah, French cuisine, in other words, right? Yeah, they don't They're want necessarily a French tart. Or they don't want French tart. fries or French toast. They want French cuisine. Um, so although I could go for some French fries, I'm sorry. Let's 
that's that's another topic on um, semantic search, um, disambig <laughs> disambiguitizing um, lexical matches versus intrinsic matches. Um, we could do a whole nother talk on that too. That's a cool project we worked on. But today we're going to do um, a little bit higher up the stack, um, up the chain. So if I type French in a Grubhub, that means I want French cuisine, and that has a material impact on what the search plan needs to be downstream. I don't want to search all the menus for the word French. I just want to find the restaurants that are French, which we have tagged. Other intents can be, what if I typed um, beef au bignon? I use that example, right? That's a dish. What if I typed Le Padoc? That's an actual restaurant name. Um, what, what would you think? Here's a trick question. Here's a hard one. Um, what is my intent if I type vegan? You type vegan. Yeah. So my naive intuition, which is probably the wrong one, is I'm looking for vegan food or a vegan restaurant. Yeah, but what is vegan? Is it a cuisine or is it a diet? Oh. Hi, you know, rhetorical question is hard. Um, there's conflicts. It's hard to dis disambiguate it. So we want to put it into some type of category. Um, and now thinking about a text classifier now, it should be clear that we want to avoid any notion of mutual exclusion, right? These classes are independent. So that'll give us a hint downstream on how we do our modeling, you know, um, cuisine. And I've got a, and diet I've just got a quick yeah. question, which is probably slightly not naive. Oh, no, no, it's clearly naive. Um, I see there are tags under these of some sort or categories or tags, right? The re uh, would a restaurant tag itself as French vegan? French bakery? Yeah. So we have models that do it and also uh, restaurants can provide it too. Cool. And users can as well? Can they suggest or? No, not at this point. Yeah. I'm Actually, uh, that's a complicated question, right? So users, when they type French and they click on a French restaurant, there's actually a signal uh -huh. back to us that is a French restaurant. Yeah. We use a technique called learning to rank to actually um, in, in, infer that. So Very cool. Um, yes to your question. <laughs> um, they, they, they give us data indirectly. So um, that's what we want to do. We want to classify these queries into some type of intent so we can do search more efficiently. Um, here's a quick outline of how search works generally. So um, there, there's like five stages. We're at the very beginning of the search um, pipeline, query understanding, um, intent classification, right? Here's a taco here. So this is important. Everything downstream kind of depends on doing this right. So let's get into what the task is at hand. We'll start getting the code. Um, and also, I, like I said, I wanted, we identified the task as text classification. That's what it is, right? And the other thing we identified is that we have this notion of um, independence between categories. There's no mutual exclusion between categories. That's important to note. And as we do this, let's once again, keep in mind productionization, right? We want to actually deploy this and use it. We don't want to be stuck in a notebook. So here's a quick diagram I um, made just for this to show how we're going to do that. We're going to do ETL. We're going to do weak supervision. We're going to do modeling. And we're actually going to publish a package with all of this work in this development notebook environment. It's going to go into a repo. It's going to be like a PyPy, right? It's just going to be another Python package in a, in a local PyPy. Then we're going to be able to integrate that into our production deployment branch. So what's the alternative? Usually data scientists will copy all this code over to a Python module, but we're not going to do that. We're going to write it once and run it. Then we're going to deploy the model to TensorFlow serving. That's what we're calling deployment. And then a client's going to hit it. And we'll show some examples of a Python and a Java client. So we got a lot to do. Um, let's get into it. Um, I have this really you know, decked out Jupyter environment I'm pretty happy about. Here's all the plugins I like. Um, code folding, scratch pad. This is a cool thing. You run arbitrary queries right here. Oh, cool. Instead of making a new cell, you know, I hate doing that. So I love that scratch pad. Um, of course, the table of contents. Lots of cool plugins. Um, check those out. This is slowing us down a little bit. Uh, Tony Fast, who's a Jupyter developer, actually mm -hmm. is in the chat right now. And he's loving the fact, or he's noting on the fact that you were using the classic notebook, which he says will never die. Uh, versus the lab. Yeah, versus Jupyter lab. I was saying, I love the table of contents on the left. Like that is, that is great. Um, I don't know how I, people I, do it without it. Yeah, I'd be lost. Sorry? I don't know how people do it without it. I'd be lost. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, especially for something like this, where you're presenting, well, you, you presumably you worked with this notebook originally, and now you're using it as a presentation tool outside. Like the notebook has yep. served both, yep. both uses. And this it's, notebook isn't just for prototyping this model. Like we're literally in a Python fun. package right now, right? I didn't share that, like, there's some metadata here. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an important package I want to tell you about. It's called NBDev, which we're using from the Fast AI group. Mm -hmm. um, so if I go back to my notebook here, like, this is our project. 
this gets built into a deployable module right here. And I can push this to PyPy. So all of these notebooks, the code with special annotations is getting extracted. I'll show you. Okay. That's cool. Great. I'll uh, it. Yeah. So anyway, it's uh, very cool seeing you're like fully tricked out. <laughs> yeah, so here, here's the tools we're going to use for the, for the, mostly the ETL. We're going to use, um, Dask is our main one, um, distributed for the cluster. For some reason, I pinned some of these in here for, you know, version conflicts. But anyways, that's the main of it. And then I've got snorkel here and this MB dev is our big one. Um, Here's the, the normal imports. The, the interesting thing here is, look, at, I'm importing myself. This is the package we're building right now. It's called Airedale. Um, and also, Matt, I re, you sent me a tweet like earlier about you know what can we expect from this presentation. And I said, an obscure cheese from New Zealand. So um, <laughs> that's what Airedale is. Um, it's like a code, eternal code name for this project. It's called Airedale. Um, so if you saw that tweet and you're wondering what it is, that's what that is. Um, actually was in New Zealand recently and I, I came across that cheese, which was quite delightful. And just quickly, did you say you're, you've got GPUs in, in, in the back end or what, yeah, what machines? Oh yeah, good point. So, uh, and, and to, the, to the Jupyter lab comment too, like, so Grub, Grubhub is great. We have a great infrastructure of ML platform team that set all this up for me. Um, we have a self-service tool. I clicked launch me this instance and I want a notebook environment. So particular instance here is a P2 from AWS. So a GPU, um, we got four CPUs. Um, and we're going to do a Dask local cluster on it. Um, and the disclaimer here is that this is a, a random subset of the data. So any numbers you see are not really representative of anything. Um, and it's a smaller set, so we can do it live. Um, so the model might have some errors, but it's, it's actually pretty good. So, and, uh, and to, to, to Matt's comment about JupyterLab, um, we have that available. I just haven't switched to it. Um, do you think I should? Is it better? Is it good? Is it... That's a whole other conversation that will take <laughs> lots of time. Let's just move on. All right. So um, here I'm starting the local cluster. Like I said, I'm not on a, a yarn cluster or anything. I got one machine, um, which surprisingly enough, and I tell a lot of my colleagues, you can do a lot of work if you're using all the cores on one machine. So we got that going. Um, we'll launch the dashboard here. So here we are. I'm um, actually yes. pre-ran this notebook, but we'll go it again. And, and, and Matt, I have a question. So um, whenever I start the local cluster, it seems to have these defaults. So um, where do these come from? They, they always seem pretty sensible. Oh, uh, we scrape like your local system environment. Uh, we're probably using the multi-processing module. I don't know how many logical cores you have. Four. Yeah. I guess we're looking at maybe PSUtil to find out your total physical memory. Yeah. There's like other things that'll show up if you're using C okay. groups, other stuff, there's other things we can look at. Okay. But, yeah, because I contrast that with the experience with Spark, it's very difficult on Spark to set up all of your um, configs. Um, there's probably- you, you have to be explicit. You have yeah. To we have actually a big spreadsheet that does it for us. Um, but I never have to do that with Dask. It just has pretty sensible ones. So I, I, it's this actually came out of Scikit-Learn. Scikit-Learn really pushed for sensible defaults. Okay. Something that Scikit-Learn said, like, actually, it's, it's a really, it's a core principle to have sensible defaults for all their, all their estimators. Uh, and this is common for data scientists. We like to have things done for us until we want full control. And so we chose the same policy in Dask. I like it. Let's get into the ETL. So, um, oh, Hopefully this is following an intuitive track. Um, we're, we want to get the search queries from our data lake. And I, I've never said that word before. Um, I think that's what this is. <laughs> um, it's a, there's a lot of ETL jobs that run every day that take raw log data, um, integrate them, um, put them into um, tables, which are just Parquet files, and register it with Hive. And these are all just sitting on S3. I think that's a data lake. So I have a bunch of Parquet files I'm loading from the lake. Um, and I'm going to um, process them with Dask. Um, so we have to think about what the labels are now, right? So we're doing supervision. We need some type of a label. Um, how do you think we can get the labels? So just to clarify, yeah. everything is un unlabeled. As we just have raw search queries. Yep. Tacos, Chinese, French. What, we don't know what the intent is unless we're humans. Well, when you say that, I do, and I mean, I think you've, I've been anchored, but you, I do think of weak supervision, right? And Snorkel yeah. does seem an ideal can candidate for that. And that's where you don't have, have labels um, and it's able to cluster and um, extract some sort of hopefully meaningful label. Well, well what's the classic way, the, 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 the lazy way, the, the, like throwing money at the problem? What is that technique? Hand labeling. Yeah, crowd, crowdsourcing it, right? Pay, some, yep. pay someone to do it. M Turks, using M -Turk, cool. um, yeah. and they'll get it done in maybe a month. So I don't know, maybe weeks. Who knows? Um, 
And that's why, you know, MTurk has always marketed itself as artificial, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. which I love. <laughs> so we could times. use MTurks, it's perfectly fine, but you know, what if you want to get this done real quick? Like, and you don't want to pay any money. There's options. Um, you can have your colleagues label things. Mm -hmm. um, we do that often for just quick scrappy projects and a lot of, a lot of models now, um, especially if you use pre-trained um, um, backends, the model can leverage um, just a little bit of label data and do few shot learning. Um, but we have some actual intuitions to label the data. No one ever thinks about this. Like, what if I know that, you know, I know every query in the world. What if I know that? Like we could list pretty much every cuisine there is. Um, we could list a big subset of the cuisines. And mm. what if we just got a big list of cuisines and just tagged labels, did you know, exact matching on them. You know, normalize the text a little bit, downcase it, normalize it, stem it or something. We can actually tag a lot of them with that simple text matching there. Um, and that's kind of the inspiration behind this week's supervision. Um, and, and I realize now that these are kind of out of order. I should have maybe explained week supervision first before I got into the ETL um, because we're gonna be pulling out our data sources. So I'll skip ahead. And then we'll go I'm back. interested in what the cuisine tobacco is, or this is literally like buying tobacco products. Oh yeah, and, and so let's answer that question with the actual label. So there is a tobacco label. Here's our canonical set of labels that we wanna do. Cuisine, dish, restaurant, address, diet, alcohol, tobacco, mealtime, other. Cool. And we'll talk about this other class later, which is a pain point right now. Um, so let's talk about week supervision real quick and then we'll do the desk stuff. So um, what we wanna do is define a bunch of labeling functions. Like we already talked about a cuisine labeling function, right? We're gonna just take all the, the queries that match our cuisine list. Um, we know what all the dishes in Grubhub are. Like we have a dish hierarchy. We can get all those, that's a big list. Um, maybe I did a quick crowdsource annotation challenge in Grubhub, right? I gave, I made like a, a, a Google sheet with a thousand queries and I just had all, all like hundred people go at it. They'll finish that in like 10 minutes. That's, that's called a knowledge base. Um, we can use that. Um, we can use heuristics, right? Um, you saw one of the, one of the um, classes is address. How, how do you guys think we can make an address detector, an address labeling function? What's like the classic way in just normal programming to, to, to find an address? Regular expressions of some yeah, sort? Yeah, exactly. Like that, there's like the regular expressions are really good at that. So we can build a pretty high precision um, address detector with that. That's another labeling function. So we're gonna define these things called labeling functions. Here's three of them, for example, um, called Lambda. We got three of them here. And here's three queries, right? Taco Bell, sushi, gluten-free pizza. This labeling function said, these two queries are red, maybe a cuisine. Um, this labeling function said it's green. That means it's a restaurant. This labeling function said it's white. Maybe it's confused because this is a diet. So mm -hmm. you might think that this is an easy task. You just take, you know, the majority vote or something. But the problem is, as you make these labeling functions, there's a lot of um, conflicts and there's a lot of um, correlation. So um, you might think these two and three are very distinct, but they're not. Um, and supervision with uh, and the weak supervision, which Snorkel is going to take care of all of that. Um, so so I just wanted to let you. No, Alex, we've got a, a compliment coming in on, on the diagram saying they're fantastic. Did, did you make them yourself? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I should give credit where credit due. This is, I stole this from the snorkel um, literature. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fantastic. I made the other ones, though. This is snorkels, though. So I don't, I don't yep. know which one they were talking about. Um, Great. So um, here, here's the tools. Um, here's all the ETL. I'll show you the quick one we do for the, the big one. So here, yeah, I need all these data sources, right? I'm pulling all of the restaurants from Grubhub. I'm pulling all the cuisines from Grubhub, all the dishes. I got this knowledge base here. Um, that a bunch of people did by hand. Um, I've got some heuristics. I've got another knowledge base here that I found. Um, people, for some reason, were doing this in the past at Grubhub, and I was able to you know, leverage that. Um, and this is the main one right here. We're going to extract all the search queries from some unknown time period. And let me just ask, it's yeah. the heuristics that you've handwritten that help with the weak supervised labeling? Yeah, th there's, there's hand rules. There's heuristics, there's distant supervision that's using like a, a data set. You can use pre-trained models, anything that will tag something. Um, yeah, right. And we'll look at those in detail in a second. I just wanna show you the Beautiful. quick, the, the DASC ETL real quick. Fantastic. Um, the big one. 
the, that does the heavy lifting. Oops, that's the wrong file. That's that's, that's the Python and, module it builds. <laughs> and while you're going there, I'll just say that I that you had a little uh, set of words that I love saying embarrassingly parallelizable or something like that's that. That's what they say, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, let's do queries. So here, here's the DAS code, right? We got two start periods. Um, this is a routine I did because, um, you know, I don't, I don't have a, I don't know how to talk to Hive, but because um, Hive would give me the queries in theory, like Hive knows what the, what the partitions are. So mm -hmm. I, I'm pulling the part, this is the routine to get the partitions. So I, all of the data of the queries is partitioned across time. Um, I'm getting the S3 links to the partitions and then I do, you know, the classic data frame, read parquet here. Let me unpack this for a second. So yeah. you have a bunch of parquet data on Amazon yeah. S3. Yep. You guys have deployed Hive on top of that data on Amazon S3 to act as, as a catalog or as a meta store. Yes. So Hive is telling you where all of your data sets are. Now, yes, if I had a SQL interface, but I don't. So that's what this routine right. is replacing. Yeah. So, I mean, so, so Hive is two things. Hive is both a SQL query engine mm -hmm. and people yeah. often use it as a meta store, as like a catalog yeah. of like, hey, where are my, where's my customer data set? Exactly. Oh, it's at this S3 bucket. Now, a big pain point for a lot of Python users who use Hive is that there isn't really a good Python Hive solution. Uh, now they can go and they can go to directly to S3. They can just skip Hive altogether. It sounds like you are querying Hive a little bit to get some information about where, where your parquet data is. I'm curious how you're doing that. I'm not. I'm okay. doing, I'm replacing a Hive call, which I should be doing, but I don't know how. So this replaces a Hive call by getting the partitions through um, traversing a file system. Okay, so you're just going straight to S3. Yep, you just yep. bypass Hive entirely. Yep. So I wish I could use Hive, but uh -huh. I don't know how right now. So this is getting the partitions. Great, thanks. Um, load them in the um, desk and we just do some processing, right? I drop the null queries. Um, I drop the ones that are shorter than two characters, just some simple pre-processing. Um, I rename the column. Um, yeah, let's actually, um, we could run this real quick. Uh, I don't know if we're short on time. Um, we'll run it, but it doesn't matter because I already ran everything. So we can skip ahead fast. So um, let's look at the dashboard. So here it is. This is this is the healthy um, cluster, right, Matt? You know, look at that. We got you know, good good utilization, no time gaps. Um, yeah. The 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 partitions might be going a little too fast. Is that that's a lot of you know inter process communication? Uh, maybe the I mean, might make it bigger. I mean, so the think? communication is just the red, right? So we're seeing very, very thin red bars. Okay. Uh, small partitions is fine. It's, okay. it's totally fine. You'll see your memory is pretty low. You're staying at sort of a healthy 1.5 gigabytes of RAM. So everything seems to be being cleared out except for maybe some final get item calls or something. So, yeah. Nice. So as you say, very healthy, very healthy computation. <laughs> Good. Um, and this was um, no um, trivial amount of data too. And we did it on a random P2, <laughs> which is not made for this. So. Pretty excited about that. Um, it does some normalization of the text too, removes some some extra spaces. Um, very simple normalization. And this is this is actually pretty heavy up here. Um, we do a group by, so uh, we have a lot of um, duplicate queries, right? You can imagine it's a, a, a power distribution, so people type, you know, Chinese a lot. Um, I wanted to dedupe the data set and add a counts column, mm -hmm. and that makes processing faster downstream for the the model training. So this is probably the most expensive thing the opt did, right? Uh, the group by. Yeah, but it's a group by aggregation. They're usually yeah. pretty fast anyway. Yeah, and this is my random comment here. I felt that the split out wasn't very fast for me. Um, so this is, this is one of those weird group bys where you have a ton of ton of items still, and you don't want one partition. Mm -hmm. So um, yep. I actually repartition it here with this heuristic I have. I multiply the number of dates by fifteen. <laughs> that works fine for me. Um, yeah, and then I just take out some outliers here with the percentile. So yeah, that's that. Cool. Work and great. I just wanted to say, as, yeah. as we're pretty much halfway through the session, I just wanted to say, <laughs> any questions out there, please do ask them. Um, Tony Fast just had a quick question. Does IBIS support Hive? Do, do we know that? Does what support I'll, Hive? I I'll, I'll take that. So okay. IBIS, IBIS is a library uh, that has like a pandas-like syntax, but that lowers down to something like SQL. So you could use IBIS to query SQL databases. Uh, Hive is mostly a SQL language, but can be, I think, a little tricky sometimes. Uh, I don't have a, I don't have a good sense, but we could go look at the docs at some point. We should be able to look at the IBIS documentation. Tony, if you feel like looking at that, reporting back, that'd be welcome. 
Yeah, I would love to replace this with an actual hive call. I'm sure if I spent more time on it, we could figure it out. Um, let's look at um, the cool thing now. Let's look at a um, weak supervision with snorkel. So I've been talking about awesome. these lab labeling functions. Um, let's talk about the address one, right? Here's the address one. Look at that regex. Wow. Made for addresses. So what this does, this is a function, has a signature, x, which is your, your data point. It's a query. Um, it's actually a, a row from your data frame. So I pull out query from the data frame, lowercase it, do some simple pre-processing. Um, so whenever you um, have a labeling function with Snorkel, um, you either say what the class is, like in this case, address, or you can abstain. So abstain is not saying that this isn't an address. It's just saying we don't have enough information to make a judgment. So you'll see every labeling function either has a strong statement, a strong you know, inclusion, or abstains from it. Right. So this just runs the regex on the address. And if it's an address, it returns an address. Otherwise, we're not saying it's not an address. It could be something else. We're just abstaining. Um, and, and we have a bunch of labeling functions. I'll show you the list. These are all, they're all defined here. Um, so we have, here, here's where I just- um, um, Did I say a gibberish detector? Yeah, yeah. here's the easier read the list. So we have a labeling function to find addresses. We have a labeling function to find dishes. We have a labeling function to find cuisines. And these, when I say match here, they're all kind of, they're exact um, string matching. So very, very, mm. very um, low recall, high precision. We have a, a merchant um, detector, that's a restaurant. We have one that uses the knowledge base. It's just a dictionary we map. We have alcohol detector, tobacco detector, diet detector, meal time, and here's your gibberish one, right? So um, this is this is kind of an interesting discussion into the internals of the snorkel algorithm. So, and we have an entropy detector and um, intent. So snorkel, let's go back to this really important detail. Um, its formulation is inherently multi-class single label. So it has a mutual exclusion assumption built in to its modeling. Does that, does that register? So when we do, uh, when we do multi-class classification, more, yeah. right? You can either have um, one class or you can have multiple classes be active. So yep. mutual exclusion versus independence. When you're using snorkel, there's a big assumption that your downstream task is, has mutual exclusion between the labels. And, and what do you mean by mutual the, exclusion? Oh, so that if it's one label, it, it is that and only that label. Our query, can a query be more than one intent? Can yeah, vegan be a cuisine and a diet? Or ice cream. Ice cream could be a dish yeah, or, yeah. Uh, or a place. You'd be surprised yeah. how many restaurants are named after cuisines. Like just, there's a restaurant called French or there's mm -hmm. a restaurant called um, Pad Thai. Um, it's very perplexing. So we actually have this independent assumption that goes against snorkel's assumption. Mm. So how can we deal with that? And also, if you have mutual exclusion, that means the distribution of your input has to be modeled perfectly. So what I mean by that is when you have user interaction models, when you work with user interaction systems, right? When input comes from a user, the input distribution is unbounded, right? A user, when they come to Grubhub, isn't gonna be well behaved and just type one of these eight things here. No. They're gonna type ZZZ, they're gonna type ASDF, they're gonna put whatever on their clipboard. Um, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a system with user input from the internet. So you get everything. Um, that's why we have this other class here to fit into the snorkel um, paradigm, the, the multi-class single label paradigm. We Great. need to that model other. Sense. And to, to your question, Hugo, that's what the gibberish detector is. Um, if someone types gibberish, um, our, downstream, our, our downstream tests fail. And someone says, why did it say ZZZ was an address when it's other? So we, we, that actually happened to me. Um, I deployed this. I didn't, I didn't realize that assumption. And then um, we had some test, case, test cases downstream on the integration that failed for input that was ZZZ. And I was like, uh, this yeah. mutual exclusion assumption is biting me. But what's the trade-off? I have no data. This gives me free data if I can just model around that assumption using this other class. Yeah. But modeling the other class is inherently very difficult. So that's what the, um, the um, gibberish detector for is for, and also the entropy detector. Um, 
So I spoke wrong. The ZZZ is for the entropy detector, right? If you type ZZZ, there's an entropy in that. So we can detect yep. it. Um, but when we just smash their keyboards or type weird things, um, that's what the gibberish detector is for. And that uses a Markov in model. Yeah. In the interest of time, I'd recommend that we stop talking about gibberish <laughs> and move on. Yeah, uh, here's an example. Five minutes left for the rest of the session. We'll get there. The model trains fast because I did that group by in Dask. Perfect. Dask helped us. Um, no duplicate data. Um, so here's an example where right? I have these nine labeling functions. Let's see what it says for sushi. Um, three of them came back with answers. The negative ones are abstains. Like this alcohol mm -hmm. doesn't know what to say when it says sushi. So one of them said it was a cuisine. One of them said it was a dish. And another one said it was a dish. And you see there's conflict there, but that's okay. Um, we're going to try and model around that and find the right answer. Cool. So here, here's the big job. We're going to take these nine functions and we need to map them across our huge data set. How do we do that? Dask. 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 I'm actually sorry. Dask. I was a little. I was just blown away for a second because I noticed there's a there's a Dask submodule inside of Snorkel, which is news to me. Yeah, Snorkel has um, two adapters: one for Spark, one for Dask. Okay, that's really um, cool. Yeah, um, and then I had to monkey patch um, Snorkel a little bit um, to accept um, a closure. Uh, sorry, uh, um, a feature from Dask, but that's not interesting right now. Okay, well, um, so, an issue. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if they call that in Python, but in the Ruby world, they call that monkey patching. Um, so one interesting thing though, is like this list of restaurants that I want to map across the data is huge. So Matt, what happens when you have a huge piece of data that you want to map across um, DAS, any, any system? It's gonna- it Depends on how you want to handle it. it. Right, I mean, what I, see, what I see you're doing here is you're intentionally sending that off to a worker ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, and broadcasting it to avoid future communication. Yeah. Um, I would hope that you know Dask would handle this for you, even if you weren't as clever as you were. My guess is that Snorkel did something maybe slightly unoptimal, suboptimal, and then Dask warned you like, "Hey, like something slightly suboptimal, suboptimal here," and it pointed you at this uh, this alternative. Well, what happened is that you know I had this. This is here, and it's maybe megabytes. And I tried to map that, and it sends that huge piece of data to all the tasks, right? Mm -hmm. So that causes a lot of overhead with the scheduler. Um, so one way to get around that is to broadcast it. And to, to use this feature, um, I had to hack, hack Snorkel a little bit. Anyways, here it is. Here's the magic. Um, it's called the Dask Labeling Function Applier. Um, this is my big data set of queries. Um, here's my big feature I had to broadcast. Um, and we'll run it, and we'll see the magic. So this is going over all of the individual queries that were yep. submitted by users. Nine labeling functions mapped across this huge query, unlabeled query data set. And we're gonna come back with a big matrix. So look, look at these, um, look at these. So we got four workers and they're running this mapping job and it takes about five seconds each. Um, right. Should I make that shorter, Matt? Or is that a good, um, you know, Matter. I mean, you're using I can, you know, make the partition smaller? You're using your system, it's all yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, the cores are definitely maxed out, which makes me happy. What I would be curious about, actually, if you're interested, uh, to hit, hit the profile uh, tab. And then, so so have you seen this, this plot before? No. OK, so the top of the plot is a flame graph. So it's telling you every line of code and how much time it's, it's spending in that line of code. So there you're looking at, you're reading some SSL things. So it's probably reading some data. So as you go down in that stack, that's the call stack. And so at the very top, we're doing some SSL decompression that's coming from Boto, AWS library. So we're reading some stuff probably from Amazon S3. Yep. Uh, and they're using S3FS, great library to read S3 data, which is probably coming from some Parquet reading function. Yep, parquet. So that whole tower of code is your read Parquet stuff. So that's your IO bound part of your computation. On well, the right, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna, um, oh yeah. Here's the monkey patches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Here we're applying your various string functions. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, oh, sorry, not to cut you off. Go ahead. I was just going to move on. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, I've got to look into that more. Thank you, Matt. That's a tool I haven't used. Um, so this is wrapping up, but we can skip ahead. So what happens when that's done is you get this matrix back. Um, I'd like to show it, but it's not done. I didn't print it out, but you get a, you get a matrix where the rows is your number of queries and the columns are the number of labeling functions. And now there's actually a model that gets you the final label because we want a final label for this. 
Um, and that's what this is. So we can look at some quick statistics. Um, I passed in a test set. Um, so our address labeling function is perfect. Um, the dish keyword matching is a little off. Um, the alcohol one's good. Um, so you get some statistics and you can kind of iterate on this. Um, to and make so them better. do you get the different um, <clears throat> labeling functions to vote in some sense or? Yeah, they all cast a vote on every data point. Yeah. But the okay, problem is right. once you get all those votes, how do you choose like what the actual yeah. label is? You got to choose one. So here's what that data structure looks like. So it's, it's just, a, it's nine, nine columns of votes. So um, yeah. you can see this one voted one right here. So this second labeling function set for this first data point is a dish. All the other ones abstain. So, but what happens if there's multiple votes? How do they agree? How do you choose the winner? And Snorkel does some interesting modeling um, that's well published and documented um, to Great. get rid of those conflicts and find um, different um, um, collinearities between rankers and come to your final solution. So let's look at the final um, results. And also we can see on the test set um, and on the training set, we get some simple accuracy measures that we can test. So actually a model of Snorkel to get the final label set. So we run it through, um, we pass it in this matrix, and then we get our final data set. And I'll show you what that looks like. So it's called probs train. And I'll use my cool little um, pull out thing. These are our labels from Snorkel. And tell me what you think is weird about them. Um, so that, that those are our labels. What is weird about this? Their probabilities. Yeah, right. You, we wanted uh, yeah. like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. What is this? Yep. This is <laughs> so. Um, maybe if you didn't know, I didn't know. Um, whenever we do cross entropy, um, it's always sparse cross entropy. There's always, you know, the labels are one hot encoded. Um, mm. But that's not true, right? What is cross entropy? It's just measuring the difference between two distributions. It doesn't say they're discrete distributions. They're actually probability distributions that we're just shoehorning into um, being discrete. So. These are our labels, and in some literature, they call them soft labels versus hard labels. So yeah, um, this one thinks with 34% probability that it's going to be um, the second class. Um, but we could also convert these to hard labels because a lot of, you'd be surprised, a lot of modeling tools like scikit-learn, for example, can't use these soft labels. So in the next line, we get these, um, we get hard labels, and um, I call them probs there. It's so usually like an arg max or something on this. Yeah, a little more tricky, but yeah. Um, so there's the normal labels we can work with. And we'll see, they have different um, characteristics and different qualities when we train the model. So um, how are we doing? We got like 15 minutes. Um, we're almost there, yeah. we're, gonna train. we're gonna train real soon. Um, this is some uninteresting stuff um, that gets rid of, <laughs> um, there's a lot of queries that we couldn't tag. There, could, there wasn't a consensus, it was ambiguous. So we, we get rid of them. Um, it's called getting rid of the abstaining ones. And then we append them to our original data set. So now let's look at our final data set. PDF train filtered. Bam, there it is. We have a query, chop suey number one, um, which was only occurred once in the data set with some pre-processing they did. And there's the label too. And here's the problem, the soft labels, hard label, soft label. Um, let's look at this one. Um, Zuni Cafe. Um, this set it was a two, which is a restaurant. Uh, hey, that's accurate. That sounds like a restaurant as a human. So uh, mm. these are our labels. We can do anything now, right? This was free. Awesome. We didn't have to wait months and pay wh however much to get these. So that's the power of snorkel and weak supervision. That's awesome. With Dask. With Dask. Dask was the infrastructure, the, the powering it through. Dask, so, um, snorkel, and pandas, and... S3 oh, is tr true. Yeah, there's a, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, definitely. Jupiter. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so write it to disk. Here's our data set on disk. Now let's get into the fun stuff modeling. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, first, we got this really, you know, tough problem, right? I'll show you the tough problem. I just loaded the data from disk. Um, here, here's the distribution of the data. So these are class labels two through nine, and these are the number of times that they occur in the data set. So, so what, what's the problem here for doing classification, multi-class classification, looking at these count distributions? Seems like they're very heavily skewed. So a model yeah. that just said two or one all the time and discounted the rest of them would be yep. accurate most of the time. It'd be hard yeah. to 
this this class six here, which I think is um, tobacco, only has fourteen examples. That's but this class, this like. this class here um, two, which is restaurants, has eighty four thousand. So mag magnitudes, orders of magnitude difference of data quality, and this is the classic imbalance problem of classification. So, um, what are some ways to take care of that? Um, the naive way, down sample, throw away the data. Um, I call it naive. I don't want to throw away data. Um, a more effective technique in my experience is to weight the loss. So we'll look at that later. Um, but we'll we'll do we'll do a little bit of um, down sampling um, because of the power distribution in our data. We don't want a lot of queries that don't exist more than once or twice. So this is a quick little DAS utility here that cuts the tail a little bit, and you can see that helps take care of our distribution. So it's now only like a couple orders of magnitude different from here to here instead of three or four. So it went from 84,000 to 8,000. And can you just remind us in this modeling section what we're actually modeling? We're generalizing the intents we've just found to more data or? We're going we're gonna to model the text classification problem. And before okay. I do that, we need to just um, take care of the class imbalance. So another interesting modeling thing I won't take, talk about it too long is that um, if you remember from our data set, we have these cool counts here. Um, like this query happened 10 times. Um, that's valuable data. We want to model that. Um, so what we're going to do to model that is weight our loss. So we're, we're going to weight our loss by the class count, which is the classic technique for balance. And we're also going to weight our loss by the sample count. You don't see that too often. So we're going to multiply the class imbalance factor by the sample factor. So here's the classic way to do it in sklearn, right? Comp this is from sklearn, compute sample weight, and it'll give you some ways to balance the loss. But also we did it, we multiplied it by the counts here, which are our groups from DAS. So we have these interesting weights here for the loss that are gonna help take care of our class imbalance and also help take care of the power law distribution. Let's get into CARES. How do we model text? How do we make a text classifier? What's a, what's, a, what's a simple model? What should we do? Naive Bayes? Yeah. What's our input? I mean, we, just have, we literally just have text. But does Naive Bayes, um, does it model sequence? What, what about the order of our characters or our words? You know, that's yeah, so important too, if, right? Has if I see Keras and like, I think some form of like RNN, recurrent neural network, work to think about memory, maybe an LSTM, yeah. I'm not so, sure. So the, the key is we want to preserve the sequence of our tokens, because those have a ton of data. And a lot of the sklearn models will ignore that. Um, mm. Not not necessarily true, you can still do it. And I, you could, but a lot of techniques will do that. So. And, and I'll also add that naive Bayes is, I always think it's ridiculously powerful for forgetting order as well, yeah. right? Yeah, well, instead of naive bits, let's think about logistic regression. Maybe the same idea, a very simple model. Um, yeah. We could still actually model sequence without going deep, without RNNs. Um, and we're going to look at a technique that was not invented by fast text, but it definitely was popularized by fast text. So um, we're going to look at the fast text style of modeling text, um, which is essentially um, subword tokenization. So instead of tokenizing, this query here into three words, we're going to break it up into multiple parts or even just characters. And then make n grams. So we're going to make one grams, so we're going to make two grams, and we're going to make three grams. And if you have three grams, that has some sequence in there. And we can still use a nice simple linear model. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make um, sub word n grams. Sounds great. And I just wanted to flag we've got around 10, 10 minutes left. Yeah, we're, we're there. Um, Wow, look at that. Here's the tokenizer. You notice I do char level. We're going to do three gram. We're going to do three gram characters. So the max gram, the three gram is going to be three characters long. And that's how we model the sequence. Some are going to be two, some are going to be one. And those are going to be all added together in a bag of n-grams. Great. This is the routine that does that. You'll see we have it here. Um, here's a bunch of models I was playing with, and you'll notice the model we use is very simple. It's called the max polling model. It's literally the n-gram embedding, 
passed in the max polling layer. We just average them together, all the embeddings. So if I put in the word pizza, I'm going to get PI, PI. So I'm going to get a P embedding. I'm going to get a PI embedding. I'm going to get a PIZ embedding, you know, for the whole word. It's going to be a bag of embeddings, and I'm just, just going to average them together, which is what max polling is going to do. And this is a very powerful way to do sequence modeling and text using a very simple linear model. I don't actually use this dropout. So here it is. Um, training. Let's do it. We're going to set up a batch size of 512. And we're going to do it for 50 epochs. And we're going to use the sock labels first. Um, if I could find where I said it. Yep, hard labels equals false. Let's do it. Oh, yeah. Let's watch those epics roll on in. Yeah. Here's the test train set accuracy. On this small subset, it does pretty good. Um, we get up to 90% ish. So we got up to 91% on the test set, 80% um, on the, sorry, on the train set, 80% on the test set. Here's some of the classic um, classification, um, precision recall things. Um, here's the learning curve. Um, but overall, we did pretty good. Um, here's the test set. Um, Cuisine had okay precision. Dish had really good precision. Um, what did we do worst on? We did perfect on tobacco with only three samples, right? There's some uh, merit mm. to our, the tough work we did on the class imbalance. It only had three examples, but it was still good. Um, so yeah, here's the learning curves. Um, they're kind of wonky um, because it's hard to train a model when you have these um, um, sample weights because it scales the loss and it jumps around a lot. Um, so this is with the soft labels and you'll notice this loss never goes to zero. We'll train it real quick with the hard label and you'll see the difference. Because when you use the soft labels, there's a lot more information to make your loss higher. So here's the hard labels. Look at that loss, it goes straight to zero. I think it's just because it's, you know, when, you're, when your labels are sparse, it's easier to get a better score. Um, if they're dense, you got a lot of other classes that compete with it. Here's the nice confusion matrix. The test train fits it perfectly. The test has some issues. That's just with the sample. Um, here's a cool thing we could do to test it out. Um, here's an example of what the, um, the feature encoding does, right? So here's pizza. You got P I Z P I. ZI, all of the n-grams. Um, you can look at the softmax here. So here's a query for cigarettes. We're actually using the model now, by the way. Here's the fun oh. part, you know, the payoff. You know, we went from zero to hero um, with um, Dask, Snorkel, and we're doing things now, right? Cigarettes. I don't know if that's spelled right, um, and it still works. Now here's a nice little test that I have I like to use right here. Um, it just runs this, all these examples through the model. So um, Taco Bell's a restaurant. Taco ball is a restaurant, right? The goal of training a test classifier is you want generalization, right? Otherwise, I could have just used the snorkel rules. We want some, you know, nice recall effects. Um, KFC is a restaurant. Um, Starbucks coffee with one E is a restaurant. I did good on these um, entropy examples. Right, that's there. how entropy detector. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, J, J, um, messed up on ASDF. Not the drag, we'll have to, you know, get more data to fix that probably. It got beer, tobacco, it's looking good. Um, mm. So that's pretty exciting. But there's a catch. We have six minutes. I'll give you the bad news. Go for it. This model is built in Keras. And all of this pre-processing we, pre we did um, up here, right, when we made these grams, this is in Python. Um, you know, all of our servers in production are in Java. Um, I can't do this. Well, I and TensorFlow. Oh. Yeah, that's why I got the TensorFlow tag here. So ideally in the future, I can do it all in Keras because the new Keras 2.0 stuff. But for now, um, we have to actually do all of the real modeling in TensorFlow. OK. So and we had one quick question. Yeah. The visualizations that were out putting then, was that a combination of uh, Matplotlib and scikit-learn and built visualizations? or? So these are all just Matplotlib. Where, where did it go? Train? Yeah. Yeah. These oh, all Matplotlib. Yeah, these are all just matplotlib, yeah. Yep. Oh, um, this is correct. actually scikit. Scikit has a thin layer of matplotlib. Yeah. Which is a nice confusing right. metric. Yeah. Yep. That's built that's into right. scikit now on the newer version cool. of scikit. The older version doesn't have it. So 
Let's so talk about this. Can we take a quick peek at your TensorFlow stuff in the next five minutes? Yeah, um, here's, the cool, here's the whole motivating reason for TensorFlow. Um, it's called train test skew. If you ever talked about you know, ML deployment, um, here's the example. Like I did all this pre-processing in Spark maybe or Dask maybe. Um, I did normalization in Dask. And then I did tokenization in Python here or in sklearn is pretty popular. But now like when I do prediction, um, I have to re-implement all of that, for example, in Java. Hmm. So you're gonna, you're gonna lose a lot in translation, right? Like who knows if my mm -hmm. tokenization code is exactly the same as it is in Java and Python. Who knows if my normalization is the same, who knows if my n-grams are the same, a lot can get lost. So that's the real value of TensorFlow. I can do all of these operations in TensorFlow graph. I can do normalization, I can do tokenization, I can do vocabs, I can do n-grams, and I can embed them all in one TensorFlow graph. So just to be clear, like the, you originally wrote this stuff with pandas and normal Python code, and you are now rewriting it not in Java, which would be very painful. Mm -hmm. You're rewriting it, it with TensorFlow operations uh, to use their implementations of string processing and such, yeah. which is less painful than Java, but maybe still a little bit painful is my guess. In reality, I went straight to TensorFlow. Um, I went back to Keras just for fun, um, but mm -hmm. I usually go straight to TensorFlow. Um, but the key is you got to do all your operations in this nice hermetically sealed TensorFlow runtime. Mm -hmm. um, and that, so that's like political thing too, right? Like if you want to get your machine learning models deployed, you got to make them as easy as possible. You don't want to, when you, when you want to give away this nice model and say that your org has to do all this stuff for you. Right, I guess like it, these days it's hard to throw a rock and not hit a company that will sell you some sort of just write your Python code mm -hmm. and will containerize it and put it yeah. behind a REST API yeah. uh, approach. Um, and so you've not gone that approach. You've gone with TensorFlow solution, which requires you to be entire, entirely in, in TensorFlow land. Yeah. So um, we'll give you a quick idea of what that is, how powerful that is. So we'll look at the graph. Um, actually, that's in some package here, in my data package. So here it is. Um, this is how you do n-gram tokenization in TensorFlow instead of doing it in Python, the big, all that Keras code I had. Um, we encode spaces with an underscore. I split the string. I lowercase it. I pass it to my tokenizer, which I defined up here. It just splits the, splits the chip characters or splits by word. Mm -hmm. And then I do the n-grams. So you'd be surprised what's in the TensorFlow API. Um, it's not like a you know, procedural language, but it has a lot of nice utility. So um, thankfully, I'm able to do all these operations and have my model accept raw tokens instead of pre-processed tokens. That's cool. And presumably it's lightning fast as a result. Yeah. yeah. I do know that I'm a little, so like I have never used TensorFlow serving mm -hmm. and I am uh, a little bit sad maybe uh, because it seems like I have to rewrite things. And I kind of, reason I like Python is I don't have to rewrite things. I can stay in Python. It seems like TensorFlow is kind of taking the same spark approach of everything has to be rewritten in that is other system. That's a little bit foreign. Um, because I historically assumed that TensorFlow serving would accept generic Python code. Um, now this is super powerful and like this isn't that onerous. You've been able to do this relatively easily. Uh, but I, I learned a little bit about TensorFlow serving today. <laughs> yeah, um, we'll, we'll, we'll actually, we use TensorFlow serving. So once we train this model, I'll show you what that looks like. Um, and while we do that, Alex, I'll just yeah. ask, we just oh, had right, a comment from Wayne saying, yeah. really nice presentation. Can the notebook be shared? Can any of this be shared? Yeah, I'll share it with you afterwards. I'll have to Great. Read so answer, yeah. Alex will share it with me, um, with us, and go to coil.io and sign up to our newsletter, and we'll send out a blog post recap okay. of, of yeah. all of this, including including the notebook. Yeah, um, um, yeah long story short, um, we export it using a special format called TF um, Save Model. That's what TensorFlow Serving accepts. That's what any TensorFlow runtime on any platform will load. Um, and here's a Python client. We load this from disk, serve it, do predictions, here's a Java client. So you build your model, export it, you can run it anywhere. And that's our end-to-end -end, um, model for text classification um, that could run anywhere that has the TensorFlow runtime. And it takes raw token, raw searched strings, not even tokens. And um, we can then export this into a package, push it on pip pip or PyPy, and then instrument that on our internal architecture so we can retrain every day. And I don't have to copy any of this notebook code. So that's the whole, the whole picture. 
Is this running today on Grubhub infrastructure? This runs every day. It trains every day um, using DAS, using Snorkel. Um, trying to show that diagram again. Yeah, runs every day. Right here, yeah. See right here, this part runs every day. That's great. I'm now like, I'm now tempted to go onto grubhub.com and like type in gibberish and know that <laughs> which, which my is. bane. So um, a Snorkel <laughs> might have some announcements on that in the future. I've, I've um, voiced my opinion to them many times and they've been receptive. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, that's great. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. And it was great to see Dask used at several points in, in the pipeline uh, as well. Um, and, and yeah, um, and seeing all the week's supervision stuff was definitely very, not, I've played around with Snorkel before, but seeing all of that and seeing how you productionize that uh, was, was wonderful. Um, so thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Absolutely. I'll just start wrap up by thanking everyone for, for, for joining on, on YouTube Live. Um, check out our website. Uh, and I've included a form um, for feedback on, on these sessions. Um, but as I'm, I'm sure you're aware, um, we're building products that make it uh, really easy for data scientists to scale Python on clusters. Um, and so if you're interested in joining us for our, our closed beta to check out what we're, we're working on, please sign up for that. Um, and go to, if you want to check out more of these sessions, give us your email address on our website um, for our weekly newsletter. Um, and without further ado, uh, let's, uh, let's close out. So I think, Matt, if you can close out the session. Yeah, can do. Alex, thank you again. Thanks again for showing up. This was an awesome presentation. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again, everyone. Bye.